you for all being here. And we're going to start with the poetic stylings of Kenny Freeze. Kenny Freeze, come to the stage. single has been anthologized and translated and all that kind of stuff. Body language. What is a scar, if not the memory, of a once open wound? You press your finger between my toes, slide the soap up the side of my leg until you reach the scar with the two holes where the pins were inserted 20 years ago. Leaning back, I remember how I pulled the pin from my leg, how in a waist-high cast I dragged myself from my room to show my parents what I had done. Your hand on my scar brings me back to the tub, and I want to ask you, what do you feel when you touch me there? I want you to ask me, what are you feeling now? But we do not speak. You drop the soap in the water, and I continue washing alone. Do you know my father would bathe my feet as you do, as if it was the most natural thing? But up to now, I have allowed only two pair of hands to touch me there, to be the salve for what still feels like an open wound. The skin is healed, but the scars grow deeper. When you touch them, what do they tell you? about my life. So I'm going to read the beginning with kind of the beginning, though I've, I've taken some out of it for, for time's sake, of I'm in the Problems of the Gods, my last book, uh, which came out in the fall of 2017, which was after I was actually here at Goddard um, last. Um, you don't need to know anything. Um, I don't think. If ever I needed the, prophet, the presence of the gods, now is the time. I arrived at Izumu Taisha, the second most sacred shrine in Japan, in early October. According to legend, the sun goddess Amaterasu built the original shrine. In every other part of Japan, the tenth month of the year is known as Kamazuki, the month without gods, because every October all eight million Shinto deities visit Izumo Taisha for Kanari Matsuri. The gods are now in residence. I stand under the graceful wooden tori marking the entrance to the shrine's forested grounds, then with my cane maneuver down the Seiki no Baba, an avenue of gnarled pines leading to the shrine's central compound. I look up. Hanging over the entrance to the Oracle Hall is the giant Shimanawa, a traditional twist of straw rope. The sculpture of straw is immense, five thick twists clinging with the assistance of six rope rings to a large wooden rod the same color as the straw, which itself is attached by four thinner rope rings to a dark brown wooden beam. Descending from the three largest twists are three cone-shaped bells. I reach for one of the twists and ring the bell. Ringing the shrine bell announces a visitor's presence to the resident deity. The gods now know I am here. Ever since the doctor told me what I did not want to hear, all I can think is, I don't want to die. I pull the rope and ring the bell again, this time louder the echo reaching toward the Honden, the inner shrine, 
directly behind the Oracle Hall. I follow the sound of bronze reverberating through the air until it dissipates in front of a steep covered wooden staircase leading into the Honden. The present structure with its projecting gray wooden rafters shooting out of the roof is in its 25th incarnation. Only half as high as its pre-Buddhist Buddhist original, at 24 meters, it is still the country's tallest shrine. Entrance to the Honden is allowed only during special occasions. Lafcadio Hearn, one of the first expatriate writers to live in Japan, lived only 33 kilometers away in Mitsui. He was the first foreigner granted the privilege to enter the Honden. I peer through the eight-legged east gate, decorated with unpainted wooden carvings and bouquets of gohei, lit lightning shaped lightning white paper hung at Shinto shrines to ward off evil spirits, and look into the Holy of Holies Hall, where only the head priest can go. I reach in my pocket for a particular coin. Two months ago, I found a penny in the hospital room where the man in the bed next to me died. Coins have taken on a larger meaning. I close my eyes and pray for what I know might be possible, to see the best way through this, to find a way to live with the ever-present knowledge of death as my constant companion. I bow and clap and throw the coin into the offering box. I hear the coin rattle to the bottom of the box. My prayers are urgent. The coin at the bottom of the wooden box could be my soul. I think when I first came to Japan to study the lives of disabled people in Japan, Ian was supposed to accompany me. By the time I arrived in Japan, circumstances had changed. During my first day in Japan, my research proved fitful, difficult. Instead, single for the first time in 18 years, I discovered not only things about this foreign culture, but also new ways to see my different body and myself. Now, on my second visit, circumstances have changed yet again. I came very close to not returning at all, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Before I first arrived in Japan, I had no idea I would be going halfway around the world alone. I'm going to just read the, the beginning of the first chapter where I actually arrived in Japan. It's actually not the very beginning, because something happens in between that you don't need to know about. We read the book for that. Um, when I land at Narita Airport, the sky is a dull gray, typical, I'm told, of Tokyo weather during the late spring rainy season. As soon as I'm off the plane, many dark blue-suited Japanese businessmen talking on their keitai surround me in the terminal. Hi, hi, they respond as they bow to what I imagine to be an autocratic boss on the other end of the cell phone connection. On the one and a half hour train ride from Narita to Tokyo, I get my first glimpse of Japan. In the late afternoon mist, the man tending the rice paddy is smaller in comparison to the surroundings. It is not that the man himself is smaller, nor his surroundings larger. The way the man fits into his surroundings seems different, but also familiar. What I see looks like the Ukiyo-e woodblock prints I have seen in museums and art books. It is as if I have somehow entered the scale, the perspective of Hokusai's and Hiroshigi's floating world. As I look from the paddy to the hills, I notice the top of Japanese hills are more pointed here. The many different shades of green in the grass and trees are more distinct in the gray of the afternoon. Lime, emerald, olive, ivy, greens with tints of blue, of yellow, even a green as dark as the billiard table green of my left behind bedroom walls. Arriving at Tokyo Station, I make my way through what is the largest and busiest train station in which I have ever been. Wide lines of people surge every which way. Countless signs, some even in English or a version that resembles English, direct passengers to color-coded subway lines, commuter lines, from Kansan lines, as well as to the seemingly endless number of station exits. How much easier this would be with Ian, who is more comfortable in a bordering on chaos crowd. Pausing amid all the constant motion, I finally find a sign with a symbol of a taxi. As I make my way in the direction the arrow seems to be pointing, 
I play over and over in my head the short phrase I learned, Ropangi Kudasai, which will supposedly politely tell the taxi driver the area of Tokyo where I want to go. Making my way toward what I hope will be the correct e exit, I check in my pocket for the copy of the Japanese map emailed to me by the International House, where I'll be staying until my apartment was ready in two days. You should hand this map to the taxi driver, the accompanying message said. Addresses are very difficult to find in Tokyo and in the rest of Japan. Surprisingly, all works as it should, and the taxi drops me off at the International House, where after checking in, I fall asleep in the single bed in my small, narrow room. The next morning, I get instruction from the cultural office at the I House of where to go to get my very own keitai and order my meishi, name cards, two essentials to navigating life successfully in Japan. Walking in Rupangi, my mind and body are lit up like the countless neon lights, which here in Tokyo are vertical. Signs in kanji, hiragana, and katakana, the three distinct pictorial and glyphic systems that comprise modern Japanese, as well as romaji, English letters, hang at every site level. Cherry cat, exciting plaza, poet box. What do these signs mean? Roaming the winding alleys, I notice the electrical poles and wires that lie in the narrow streets. I wonder how secure they would be during an earthquake or a typhoon. Many fires and natural disasters have devastated Tokyo. Impermanence seems closer to the surface here. Inundated by so many unfamiliar sounds and images, will I remember my way back to the eye house? Tokyo might be the only city in the world where you can make a right, another right, another right, and another right, and not end up in the same place as you began. It's a gospel. I'll leave it there. 
Um, and there, it, there is a note to the reader. One of, one of them won't make sense to you unless you see it on the page because it's like it's imitating some, a scroll found in a cave. So there are fragments missing. So there are signs that denote a, a missing fragment. Okay? And then what you need to know is within this testament, the words soul and mind are interchangeable, i.e. the soul is the mind and the mind is the soul. Uh, within this testament, Elder Bar refers to the God of words. Elder Bar has two functions. One, it inhabits earthly bodies to express itself and it provides words when humans ask for help to verbally express what is in their soul slash minds. Um, and within this testament, the word ruach just means to the eternal breath that links humanity. So this gospel is written down by an inscriber and here, here, so I'm beginning now. This is the beginning of the book, inscriber's note. Beloveds, my ancestors traded in the purple dye of murex shells, which made certain that, that I was born into a blood family of privilege. Despite coming from a people who encouraged only boys and men to read, my father saw to it that I could examine for myself the laws of our land and the rules of our faith. At the time, I was never sure why I should desire to write and read a language of edicts, decrees, and commandments that wanted to shut me out. It is only now revealed to me why this skill, this gift of inscription, was placed in my hands. Beloveds, I am Arsinoe E. of Canaan. I was part of the family of apostles. While it is true that our family, as it once was, no longer exists, it is also true that since his death, I have remained connected to her, to the apostle to the apostles. Beloveds, I am not certain if anyone can choose to completely leave behind a calling. I believe that a calling might change its outward appearance, but the soul, which is the mind, nourishes it and coaxes it to change its form and beckons it to keep going. Beloveds, once she had made her decision to release her story, the eternal breath filled her and the God of words guided her. Beloveds, I do not claim perfection in my lettering but I do claim to have accurately inscribed every word offered to me by my sister, who is my mother, who is also my daughter. I neither encouraged her to speak nor interjected my own testimony. Instead, I put my skill to use. Beloveds, my calling was to write. Her calling was to teach. Beloveds, it is her words that follow. One. This section is unreadable. And some of us stay silent. We are afraid that once we release our words, others will snatch them out of the air and bend them to suit their own desires. I have kept mute as others have spoken, but now I worry that their words will be carved into the shoulder blades of camels, while mine will disappear like incense smoke. What I have witnessed are partially true testimonies of our time together, words spoken with just enough authority to ensure future posterity. This is one of the differences between a woman and a man. A woman knows when to keep her mouth shut to protect herself from the violence of men. And when I say violence, I'm not speaking of a man's fist bruising a woman's body. Neither am I speaking of a public stoning. I am speaking of the damage that is done when a man looks at a woman and sees a child, or a harlot. I have heard the lies. I have stood in my silence, but my time of grief is ebbing. I am ready to offer my words to the Apostle Asamoe of Cana to inscribe, and I have faith that Elder Baal will provide the words to tell this story. It has been 20 years since I saw the blood that announced my womanhood. In all this time, I have not once sold my body. In truth, I have known only two men. The first, a husband whose wrath made me fear for my life. 
and the second a man who was my husband, my father, my brother, my son. This second man, though he loved me and treated me well, did not belong to me. He belonged to Ruach, as I too belong to the eternal breath, as we all do. He was taken from me too soon. The injustice of our courts named him King of the Jews. The misguided called him Savior. Others who had and still have the boldness of unwavering faith named him Son of God and God incarnate. King, Savior, Son of God, God incarnate. I do not recognize these names and neither did he. Since his death, safety has been my greatest concern. Some of those who were once known as apostles have met with untimely deaths. His mother lived her last days beside me, and I knew the comfort of caring for her until she drew her last earthly breath. My sisters stayed with me for as long as they chose to do so, but now all except us and we have left me to begin new lives. I cannot blame them for this choice. To continue our teaching would have put their lives in danger. Instead, they chose a life of invisibility, of safety. One of our surviving brothers has continued a version of our work and laid claim to our teachings without me. It was only his blood brother, Simon, who said, Brothers, surely it is Sister Miriam who holds the fullness of this work. Surely, when dawn, when dawn broke open the sky this morning, I walked to the river to offer my thanks and to ask for guidance. But before I had finished, Elder Bar interrupted me. The God of Words said, do not wait for others to invite you to speak. Simply thank the eternal breath for making you in all your wisdom. Offer your thanks with a raised head and a heart uplifted to the sun. Open your arms, press your feet into the earth, and anoint yourself with these words. I am here. I am here. I am here. When the train stopped, 
They stayed in their seats. And where there was no announcement about the explosion, no movement, the few passengers in the compartment began to look at each other, then look away. Out the window, Lily noticed people were beginning to leave the other cars. A man and his wife, arms around each other, walked directly under her window, heading along the tracks in the direction the train would have taken them. Then there were others, and she wanted to call out, what had they heard? What happened? Could they see it? She thought it was a bomb at first, maybe still burning in a nearby factory, but the others didn't seem afraid. Lily imagined an accident on the tracks, even a suicide, and wondered if she could wait it out, if she could stay safely in her seat and never have to see the wreckage, the life destroyed. As more people walked by, the passengers around her got up to leave, and Lily found herself rising. Better to be with a group heading for the city than to end up alone. Outside, the stream of people was thin but steady. They walked for a long time besides the tracks, passing other train stations. They acknowledged each other only by moving to make room when the clearing narrowed, but no one, not even the children, whispered about what might have happened. By then, the glow over Hiroshima was unmistakable. August was a hot month, but this was different. The air was scorched, sizzling, rippling everything out of sight. The black rain had already fallen. The firestorms were sweeping through anything that could still be burnt, including people alive and trapped in the rubble. Lily didn't know yet. She wouldn't hear these stories until later. Then, she was still walking through her final step of innocence. They did not know yet. They could never have imagined. Still couldn't believe when, even when the black ghosts began to approach them. From a distance, the ghosts looked like people, but as they got closer, something was wrong. Their hair, for one, puffed and frizzy, even in the distance. Their color. From her vantage point, with the sun in her eyes and a strange glow behind them, they seemed to be completely in shadow. As they got closer, Lily could see it was their skin that was black. Some of it burnt to expose white bone, some of it hanging off their bodies. What it seemed to be a crowd when she first saw them had little. People falling off in the wake of the rest to sit or lie down on the ground. Those who continued walking held their arms floating in front of them like sleepwalkers maybe to avoid the pain of rubbing the raw nerve, not raw nerve, maybe with the instincts of a woman holding the hem, her hem off the ground to keep their skin from dragging since most of them were now too deeply shocked, too far beyond feeling. They didn't even look at the passengers. No one asked a question. No one offered a warning. It would have been horrifying if it wasn't so clearly a nightmare. Sometime in the future, she would remember screams. She would remember silence, the first sight of the bodies clogging the Okagawa River, lying like a dam that should have raised the level of the water. You could walk over them, she thought. It was how she understood they were all dead. She would remember questions whose answers she already understood had no power to help her. What had happened to her? Lily didn't look for Hanako when she was able to get close enough to the city to skirt the edges she couldn't get near the castle. Instead, she searched everywhere for her father-in-law, even though she knew he could only have been in two places, the house they lived in, which had been engulfed in a huge lake of flames for the hospital. He was the bedridden one, her responsibility. Yet, she was wandering through streets that no one she knew would ever have traveled. She couldn't think. There was a woman with her head submerged in a drum, her long hair still swaying like seaweed in the murky water. A child huddled blind under his dead mother's arm. Toshi, she thought. At least he was not in the city. At least she was not the dead mother, so the child couldn't be hers. There were so many tiny bodies. So many people of all sizes. Up close, she could see that those who had Warm white clothing with darker patterns had been seared, their skin oozing in wounds that matched the charred, once dark designs. Their faces blurred, rubbed over. People without eyes, without ears, without a nose. 
There was no way to recognize anyone, but Lily was afraid to stop moving into the city, out of the city, direction didn't matter. Others were doing what she was, searching automatically just to have some place to go. She couldn't help, she couldn't stop either. She had seen an older man stop. She had watched the horror hit him. He raised his hands high to the sky, calling out for the gods to take him and return his wife instead. She had watched him crumple to the ground and stay there. Lily kept going. She walked the ruined city all day, burning her hands and the soles of her feet through her sandals before she ended up in the hospital. There were bodies lying in the hallway, in the courtyard, and camped outside the front door, more injured, more dying, and others just in shock with no food and nowhere to go. Nowhere was where they all were, she realized. There was no outrunning it, an entire city incinerated by a single bomb. Her son, she thought, he was a tiny light in a sea of lights that she once believed would be protected. She had believed people had rights, that the good would be rewarded, that life was precious and fair. But no one was safe. And in the caustic embers of the city, surrounded by the impossible, this truth that she had spent all day eluding finally caught up with her. Her hope guttered out. She sank down against the wall of the building and closed her eyes. Thank you, Rebecca, for um, a painful but beautifully told reminder of why we write for the world. And deep breath. Up next, prepare yourselves for the political machinations mm -hmm. of Rahelia Martini. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things uh, about residency is how much creative energy there is, and, uh, and also how, how vulnerable all the writers are. Uh, you, you were creating work, and you were putting it out there for the first time. So I decided to do the same thing. So what you're going to hear is brand new, and the wonderful thing about it is that you may be the only ones that will hear it. Uh, so you have an incredible privilege here. So, um, so, Okay, so the events uh, took place a couple of years ago, and uh, I say scene one, but there is no scene two, so. Uh, so. <laughs> a barber shop, except it's different. Uh, something's off, it's not clear what. There's one chair. We'll call him the barber, but he probably has a name. He's sharpening a straight razor, a man, Will Landrix. The door's shutting behind him. We get a quick glimpse of someone in military uniform, but that's about it. The barber says, ah, do you mind if I practice my English? Will, I was gonna ask you, would you mind if I practice my Spanish? The barber, we well, can't agree, so English it is. <laughs> you know, well, fair enough, barber. Host country, you are our guest, you do what you're told, not come over and sit. Well, in my country, barber, but this is your country, well, it's where I was born, yes, but it's not Barbara. That is right. You were born here. It's well, the country I'm a citizen of, the United States, uh, well, the guest gets to choose Barbara. You are a citizen of this country. If you check your passport, you're not traveling. Well, if you check your passport, it's American. It's American passport. It is Cuban. It is not American. Will, well, that's the rule. It's anyone born in Barbara said, Will. Anyone born here needs to return with a passport, Barbara. Rules don't make sense. You get to an age, you choose country, you choose wife, you choose country, you make the wrong choice, but here you are anyway. <laughs> well, your English is not bad, Barbara. I wanted to, I wish to be, yes, wanted past tense, I wanted to be translator. It goes an old word out again. Well, why am I here, Barbara? You are to interview. Well, well, yes, that's right, I have a meeting with him in an interview, but, well, it is an unusual time, Barbara. What is that? Well, it's three in the morning, Barbara. Yes. Well, it's three in the morning, it's not time uh, to interview. Well, well, casting that aside, Barbara, I am not losing this English you use. Well, three in the morning, it's not time for a shave, Barbara. 
I was woken up in bed with a woman who was not my wife to come here and shave your beard. <laughs> well, okay, fair enough, Barbara. What is fair about that? <laughs> well, nothing, I suppose, Barbara. Let's start. Well, I am a in a country that is unfriendly, Barbara, or not. Well, let me finish. Our relationship is strained, not good. I'm, I'm here to interview a man who has, well, frankly, he's pissed us off for a long time. But no, it's three in the morning. I have no idea where he is, and I have been brought here to a barber who has dragged out of bed with you sharing with a woman who is not his wife. Barber. We both have reasons to be unhappy, but I need to shave your beard. Will. So you can go back to bed with Barber, yes. Will. I use Gillette. When I do shave, uh, Gillette, it's the best a man can buy. Barbara, yes, now I see why I was not chosen to be translator. I have no idea what you just said. Will. I don't like a man to hold a razor so close to my throat. Barber. I am a professional. Will. Even so, Barber. 20 years I've wanted to be translator, but this is what well, I get that your dreams did not come to fruition, but what I would like to know, what, what I would like to happen is for me, for someone to come get me and drive me back to my hotel or straight to him. Barbara, it was not explained? Well, what, what was it explained, Barbara? Fidel Castro has never met with a journalist, diplomat, head of state, or local idiot who also had a beard. In a room where there is a camera, there's only one person with beard. Now I can shave your beard and maybe you can do what you come to do, or we can both sit here and see what happens next. Well, that's not a threat. What's he like? Barbara. The truth? Well, off the record. Barbara. What does that mean? Well, I am not going to credit the sources. You can tell me anything and in your identity, Barbara. Off the record does not mean, well, I'm not carrying a tape recorder, Barbara. But there's no need. We're being recorded. Every word you say, every word I say will now exist forever. Well, you mean we're what? Barbara, explain. Well, I will not get to meet him if I have a beer. Barbara, uh, sit down. Will says, Barbara applies the hot towels. Barbara, how is that? Well, good. Now he lathers them off. At this point, there is no more conversation. I will do all the talk. If you talk, it is possible that your movement will cause me to cut your throat and you will die. Yeah. Ah, no, we're talking. I have started. The first thing I want to advise you, ah, advise you, I like that, my English, not so bad. That's not a question. Don't answer or you will die. Three quite things you need to know about. Three things you need to know about that. He wears glasses, but never in public or never for a journalist. This rumor will be denied. Why this is important for you to know is that you must never hand him a piece of paper to read. He's blind. He will not read, and if your photographer takes a picture of this, it will not happen, of course, because film disappears quickly, but that's not necessary because only official photographs will be taken. This means you will shake hands with him, photo. He will look you seriously in the face, photo. If you shake his hand, photo, three photos for you to publish. The second thing you must know is that if he does not, not like the line of question, he will. He is unpredictable. Do not ask him about a food shortage, the Pope, Mark Rubio, or anything to do with the state of Florida. Do not mention camps of any kind, or gays, or women who are also gay. Mention the Soviet Union once. He will discuss Bernie Sanders and your current president to be, but he has no interest in lost emails, misplaced objects. You can ask him about war, capitalism, Marxism, socialism, but no other word that ends with ism. There's a final thing you must know about him. He does not believe he will die. There is no God. Do not ask him about the afterlife. Do not ask him about all the dead bodies, where they are. Third and last, he knows they're CIA. He understands that the American press is not to be trusted. And it is likely you will say false statements. He is not stupid. In your report, you will be allowed to make false statements because it is false news. Don't make the mistake of making it all lies or but that will be for another time. He raises him up, shows him the shade. Barbara says, look surprised. I have done a good job, right? Only a little blood, a little cut, a little souvenir. <laughs>